will know that for the Maori people, rain is quite auspicious when there's an occasion. And also for Tibetan, for Tibetan people, it's very auspicious when there's a special occasion, if it rains, it's a blessing. So, <laughs> so that's really good. Uh, pardon? Wairua. 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 Yeah. Very, very much. <coughs> now, this is our donation box, and it's over there on the little table. Um, and I've got a little message here, giving generously in the spirit of divine love. So I'm sure you'll all respond to that. And it'll be over on the little table there. And this, um, Jen has bought some DVDs, uh, free ones, just for you to take if you haven't, um, if you haven't actually, you know, got some of them. Um, most of the ones that are there, I've got, and I think have been copied and circulated. So, but, but if some of you, you know, haven't actually got any. Uh, Jen's very nicely brought along some to share. So without much ado, welcome AJ. Thanks, thank <laughs> well, uh, how many of you have actually seen any of the presentations at all? Is there some that have never seen any presentations? Can you put your hand up? On DVD. A DVD, yeah, you've seen mm -hmm. anything on that. So some of you have never seen anything on any of the DVDs, is that correct? Okay, and uh, some of you have seen just a few DVDs, is that, is that right? Okay. Probably about half a dozen. About They've half. had um, the initial one that you did, yep. the introductory one, um, most people, and um, the fear, the law of attraction, um, the questions and answers, the found soul. Yeah. Uh, so those have been copied and circulated. No so worries. Most people didn't. No well, what I, what I wanted to do today was give you an opportunity to ask questions and so forth. And uh, but but if you haven't already seen something presented, obviously I'll need to present at least something for you for those ones who haven't seen something presented. So uh, perhaps what I would like to do is just revise some of the basic principles of what I present to people generally, and uh, and then we can go from there. And you can ask your questions freely once uh, a question comes to you. How does that sound? So if we could have hands up with questions, so that way we can have it all orderly, um, and I can go from one to the other, and I'd be perfectly happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Myself and Mary have to leave around probably half past one, two-ish, around that time. So what we're probably going to do is talk for, if you find it interesting enough, we'll talk <laughs> for uh, about, till about quarter to twelve or something like that, and maybe have a half an hour, three quarters an hour break, and then we'll continue talking for those who want to stick around as well. No worries. Well, as uh, most of you may know by now, my name's uh, Alan John Miller, so that's where AJ comes from. And my, uh, my, um, my background, I suppose you could say, is that I, I grew up in a, in a very basic country town in Australia, uh, out in the middle of the bush, uh, on the River Murray. Many of you know of, of Australia? So, uh, so a little town called Loxton was where I was born, and, and uh, we lived in a what was called a Nissan hut at the time. I noticed you have a few of those around here, actually. Those um, tin, uh, curved tin uh, roof huts. And we lived in that until I was a couple of years of age, and then we lived in a housing permission home. So that's my, my background. I come from a fairly poor family originally, and then slowly my parents, uh, as many did probably during the 60s and 70s, slowly uh, gained some, uh, some self-sufficiency, I suppose you could say, and became uh, what you would probably call middle class now. So that's, uh, that's our, our, my background. I'm also uh, a computer electronics, uh, I'm an electronics engineer and computer technician as well, and a computer systems engineer, but I gave all of that away uh, quite some time ago, uh, now six years ago or so, and, uh, and started teaching the stuff that I'm teaching you today. So that's uh, my background. I'm uh, one of those people who feel that spirituality should be very logical. Do many of you agree? <laughs> I know that on the other side there's a lot of people who feel that spirituality is very um, mystical. And I don't really agree with that. Because the reason why is because of my concept of God, which I'd like to present to you. So if I draw God as having masculine and feminine characteristics, 
And the reason, by the way, why I believe in a God is because um, I've personally experienced the feelings of the connection with God. And a person who hasn't personally experienced it is going to find it very, very difficult to believe in God uh, unless there's some kind of intellectual acknowledgement as well going on. For myself, there's this personal belief in God that involves... Surround, God is the, God's primary qualities, if you like, are divine love, so love that comes from God, and what I would classify as divine truth, which is what I would call the absolute truth. So if, so if you could choose the absolute truth of any subject, then God would know it, which would make sense, wouldn't it? If God created everything, then of course God would know the absolute truth on, on any subject possible. So, so that being the case, here's little old me down here. Let's draw me as a, I'm a soul, which we'll talk about in a, a bit later. Obviously, I'm in a certain state of truth myself, and I also have different errors inside of me. Whenever I'm in harmony with truth that's the same as God's truth, I could say that I'm now in harmony with God, or I'm in harmony with God's truth at least. But whenever I'm in error, whenever I have a belief system or an emotional condition, which is more important actually than even a belief system, if, whenever I have a belief system or an emotional condition, that's in error, I am obviously now not in harmony with absolute truth and, and therefore not in harmony with God. So if we look at this aspect of divine truth or absolute truth as being a very important principle to understand, and that is that there is someone in the universe, and it's not me, and not you either, but there is someone in the universe, which I'll classify as God at this point, who actually created the entire universe and therefore knows the absolute truth of everything going on in the universe at any one moment in time. Does that sound like a good enough concept to start with? And if that person or being, rather than a person, so obviously they're, they're a bit more larger than you or I, so obviously we can't classify them as a person, but they are, let's call them an entity or a being that I can connect to and I can actually start receiving divine truth from that connection with God. So I can actually start examining the universe completely and I can examine it in a number of different ways. I can examine it physically which means looking at all the physical laws of the universe, looking at the laws of physics, of science, and so forth. And when I'm in harmony with divine truth, I will find the real way everything operates and works. And if I'm out of harmony, then I have to experiment. So the scientific method today basically is you experiment with something until you see it fits most of the rules that you've created, usually for ourselves. And once we do, we sort of hold on to that theory as a fact until such time as somebody else comes along and says, no, no, that's actually a theory. Here's some more evidence and here's some more facts. And we add those facts to the previous facts and then we realise, wow, there's actually different theory that we'd have to come up with to match those facts now. And then we go along the line of experimenting a bit more and coming up with more theories. And, and before you know it, when you think about it from that perspective of experimentation, before you know it, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of theories and thousands, and in fact, as many theories as there are people often. And, and, and what we're doing is we're all running around with our, all of our different belief systems and all of our different theories about how life works and how our bodies work and how the soul works and, and how the universe around us operates. But all of us are still, obviously, many times in disagreement, and this is why there's so many religions on the planet, there's so many different, even, even physical, scientific processes on the planet that are very, very different to each other. And this is why some scientists in a certain area disagree totally with another group of scientists in, in, this, in the same area. And then there's another, there's a group of people who follow theology in one area, and they disagree completely with the group of people who follow theology into another area, and so forth. And that's the result, I feel, of us not connecting to the source of all things, which is God, and therefore God's truth, or divine truth, and there's a mechanism by which we can do that. And it's that mechanism I'd like to talk about first, 
and then we'll talk about how the universe is constructed and how that fits in with everything. Is there any questions so far as to what, what I'd like to present? Yeah? No? Okay. Alright, so let's say that I <coughs> made up not just, and, I, and this is just a, again, anything I present to you is going to be a theory until some, something happens inside of you to prove to you that it's a fact or not. So I can present a heap of things to you that I feel are true, and until you're in a state where you have can, or, and, or you want to experiment with them, and in the process of experimentation you start working your way through different things, you may at some point in the future either believe it to be true or believe it not to be true. And that's up to you, isn't it? Because we all have free will anyway. We can decide what we want. So my, let's call it a theory at this moment, for, for your sake, because I don't feel it's a theory, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be presenting it. Um, but it, from, from a person's point of view of hearing, it's got to be a theory until it's proven fact for themselves. So my feeling is that God created a heap of souls. Let's call them God's children. Each one of them being made in God's image in the sense that they have masculine and feminine traits and characteristics. And then God created a process by which these souls can discover themselves and discover the universe. And God set up a whole heap of laws, uh, which I would call divine laws, that allow the discovery of the universe in a safe manner. No person in this universe can destroy the universe. We can often destroy bits of it by our actions. So, you, you know, we were driving around yesterday and we could see... Up, we were driving around the Cowrie Forest area up north and, and we could see that, yes, man had done a lot of destruction there um, and there's only these small Cowrie Forests left what, in what would have been, must have been massive forests. Over, over, and, and that was all destroyed over a few, like less than 150 years in, in most cases, right? So the truth is we can destroy some of the universe but we can't destroy our own soul and we can't physically destroy the entire universe. We can, but all of these laws are in, in place to prevent us from doing that, and we'll discuss some of them if you want later. But one of the laws that are in place is, most of the laws in place are in reference to our own soul, the human soul, the human being. And the soul is very, very different than the bodies, because what happens at the time of incarnation, which is soon after the time of conception, is that at the time of conception, bodies are created. So I'll just draw... There's two bodies created, in fact, at the time of conception. And the half of the soul connects to these bodies. And this happens at the point of what I call incarnation, the time when people enter the earth, if you like. So this is happening on earth. So the two bodies are the material body, or the physical body, and the spirit body. And these are connected via some energy connections, which people sometimes name in the spirit world. Some of them call the silver cord. Have you ever heard that term when you're doing some new age things? And there's also a connection to the soul, which let's call it the golden cord for the sake of a name. And these energetic connections are a bit like, a bit like plugs, if you like, where the body the physical body plugs into the soul and the spirit body plugs into the soul. So the spirit body and the physical body become the mechanism by which we as a soul experience the universe in which we're living. So if the universe in which we're living is physical, then we experience the sensations of that universe through the material body, the body that we can touch now. But if the if the uh, universe that we're experiencing it through is spiritual, so that's what happens as soon as you die, or every night you go to sleep, you are now experiencing it in the spiritual. And also, by the way, any time you go what's called out of body, you're experiencing now the spiritual realm or the spiritual universe. And that universe interfaces, if you like, or the sensations of that universe are experienced through the spirit body, and all of those sensations and all of those actions that you take and the reactions that you 
uh, feel and all of the feelings and emotions and even the physical sensations that happen through your physical senses and your spirit body by the way has a whole group of senses as well and all of that sensory information gets entered into your soul and so I feel your soul is the real you and the bodies are just like they're just appendages or tools that the real you uses to experience either the material world or the spirit world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And by the way, you get to a point where you don't need bodies at all uh, to experience, and that's what uh, what is what I'll call later the soul union state. We'll talk about that. So let's say both halves and the soul splits into two halves at the point of incarnation, where we actually and each half is attracted to the type of body that matches the majority of its traits. So if the majority of the traits are masculine in nature, then, then what will happen is that you'll be attracted to a masculine body. If the majority of the traits are feminine in nature, then you'll be attracted to a feminine body. Now inside of each part half, obviously there is still the opposite type of traits. So in other words, the feminine doesn't all, isn't all feminine. It obviously has some masculinity in it as well. And the masculine isn't all masculine. It obviously has some femininity in it as well. But it's the, the, the bodies that you're attracted to are very much defined by the dominant traits of the half of the soul when it incarnates. So then we're incarnated. Now that happens shortly after or at the time of conceptions. In fact, m uh, many people realise it when they're uh, pregnant. Many of you ladies who have been pregnant would have realised the moment you felt like you were pregnant. And the reason why is because straight away you're aware that there's another soul present inside of you, uh, not just your own, not just your own connected. And so from that point on, you're, you're now nurturing this new soul which is connected to two bodies, to the spirit body and the material body, just like you are connected right now to both bodies. And all the spirits that are here with us uh, don't have the phys physical body connection. They have the spirit body connection. But if the spirit body is capable of experiencing a lot more than the material body is. And so when we're a spirit, we can, like any spirits that are here, can see you quite clearly. Right? They don't actually see your physical body as clearly as they see your spirit body because their main interface is their own spirit body and that's by the sight by which they see. But they can also see your physical form as well because it's denser in matter. So, so any spirit who's here is still hearing the same information as I'm presenting it just like you would be hearing it through your ears. There's spirit body senses and hearing is one of those senses. And you don't lose your senses when you die. You actually have more sensory apparatus available to you when you pass. So you have different senses that you wouldn't normally be able to see or have here on Earth. And one of those that some people are, are developing already. Have, you, have any of you developed the sense of seeing an aura? Have any of you seen or sometimes seen an aura? Yeah? And the aura is the energy, if you like, that this spirit form gives off. And, uh, and so you're already allowing yourself to notice that you have this sensory apparatus that are a part of your spirit form. Some people also have had the experience of having pictures come through, sort of like, almost like it's not through their sight, but there's this second sight that, uh, uh, thing that happens. And sometimes you see pictures, even in your awake state. You've, seen them. You've ever had that happen to you, some of you? Well, that is actually your spirit body sight seeing those particular experiences. Mm. Right? So it's your spirit body that has the, also has the, the, the sensory apparatus of sight. So if we go, if we look at our body at the moment, so here's our body, we've got our sight. What are the five senses that we've got that we generally refer to? We've got our smell. We've got our hearing. You notice how many of them are around our head? <laughs> hearing. <laughs> hearing. Taste and touch. So we've got taste is still there as well. And then we've got, let's put it there, touch. Right. Now that's what we call our physical senses. But in reality, there are far more senses than we have than that. 
Many of you have gone and walked into a room and felt really uncomfortable when you walked in the room, right? Well, why did you feel that? There's got to be some other sense going on there, doesn't there? To cause you to feel uncomfortable walking into a room. So that's beyond these senses of to do with your physical form. So how, how many of you have, found, have woken up in the middle of the night quite afraid because you feel there's somebody there but you can't see them? Mm -hmm. uh, this happens quite often. How many have happened when you were, when you were little? <laughs> when you ask that question, most people would have that, that experience, right? And the reason why is because these senses are not the only senses you have or that you can develop. There's a whole group of other senses that you can develop and that you have. And these senses, so you could say these senses belong to your physical form, but you could say behind your physical form there's this spirit body form that has also a lot of other sensory apparatus, most of which we never develop while we're on Earth. So most of us get so hooked into the physical, mundane, and you see most people when you're you know, out driving around or in a shopping centre, most people are just very connected, aren't they, to their physical senses not very connected to their spirit senses, but they do notice them happen during their life most of the time. They just don't want to talk about it very much generally. Right? Why? Because most of the time when we start talking about it, it all sounds quite, you know, out there. Like, and so most people... <laughs> like that, yeah. and, and most people are worried about being taken away. Like, <laughs> and, because of their crazy mind now and playing tricks on them. But in reality, there's this, all these senses that have happened. Now, now some, of, some of you have visited a psychic or something like that. How many of you have done that? Like, pretty much? So, so they are now tuning into a lot of their spirit body <coughs> senses, right? Now, you can develop your spirit body senses just like you can develop your physical body senses without love being involved at all. So, in other words, you can actually develop yourself and your spirit form without developing in love. And what I'm trying to present to people is, though, if you develop in love, you will develop everything automatically. And that's something we're discussing. In, in a so just from a Christian perspective, I'd argue you can't separate divine love from divine truth and the, and the, and the spirit. It's all it's like an apple. Yep. Like it's skin, flesh and seed, it's all one. Well my experience has been that you can separate them in the sense that you can actually be in a state where, you, oh, when I say separate them, and they are two different things, but they work hand in hand together. So, so my feeling is that, they, is that they can't be separated from the point of experience, but they can be separated in a point of definition. Because love, to me, is a feeling, and truth, to me, is a fact. Do, do you see the difference? Like truth, um, for example, if we can, we can go out to, uh, you know, across the road there and stop a car and pull it over to the side and ask all the occupants to step out, and we could then sit down and, uh, with them and describe their physical appearance. So we could describe, yeah, he's got blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, he's, you know, six foot one, is you've got a certain body type and a body shape. Now, they are all what we would call facts about the person. But that really tells me nothing about the person at all, about their soul, about their feelings. And also, although I now know a heap of truth about that person, I'm not necessarily loving them, and they're not necessarily loving me either. You know, they could be quite angry that I stopped their car and <laughs> asked them to go out. So, so the truth is that I can describe a heap of facts, but the aspect of love or the emotion may not be present. Now, with God, that's never the case. But with, often with us on earth, that's often the case, where we're describing facts around us that we believe are facts, but in reality we're not having any emotional connection with these facts. And so when I describe, the reason why I describe divine truth and divine love separately is because there's a mechanism by which we can receive love and part of that mechanism is coming into harmony with God's truth. So in other words, we start seeing the facts and as a result of seeing the facts, something happens inside of us if we connect emotionally inside of us to these facts 
that opens up our soul and then when we start we can start opening up our soul to receiving love as well and what I've also found is that if you open up your soul to receiving divine love God's love then a lot of the facts come to you automatically like you don't have to go out and discover them so much. They automatically become present in, in your life. And we can talk about that a bit. But I agree with you in the sense that, yes, it's impossible to separate God from love or God from truth. Because God is intrinsically those things. But truth is not God. And I don't feel God love is God either. I feel that uh, it is one of God's qualities or attributes. So it's a bit like um, with yourself, you could say that uh, because your hand is connected to your body, which is connected to your soul, a person could say to you, well, your hand is you. Well, I don't agree with that, obviously. Your hand is an appendage of you, or a characteristic, or a tool that you use. And I also feel that God has, is an entity in a similar sense. Not, not physical, not humanoid like us, but God is an entity and God has attributes and qualities that are part of, their, of God, but they are not God. So when people say God is love, I agree, God is love, but I don't agree that love is God. Because God is, because love, God is much more than just love. And when I say just love, I'm not denigrating love, because love is one of the greatest, and divine love is the greatest quality that I've personally experienced. But that still doesn't mean that's God. Right? Love is a quality that God has. Do you see the difference between? Um, whereas most people believe that love is God, so sometimes, sometimes people feel that God isn't an entity. And I feel very strongly that God is an entity, and God, one of God's qualities or attributes is this love, this divine love that she can give to you. All right, so we've got all these senses that we're now experiencing the world with. We're now experiencing our universe. So what do we do with that now? Well, there's really only one or two things we can do with it in total, in the sense that we can either grow or we can stay stagnant or reduce in, in our knowledge. When I say, so we can either progress or we can regress. Um, we can grow or we can, or we can shrink, if you like, in our, in our soul and in our experiences. Now, many people feel that uh, they just grow. And I don't necessarily agree with that because what I've observed with different people that have uh, spoken to me, but also with different spirits that I've spoken to, is that you can also shrink uh, in terms of your experience. You can, you, can, you can stop yourself from experiencing certain things. If I can give you an illustration of that. Most people are very um, scared of this thing called vulner vulnerable? Is that how you spell it? Being vulnerable. What does vulnerability mean? Doesn't it mean being totally open to everything that may happen in, in, inside, including being open to being loved and open to love and so forth? Now, for a lot of people, being vulnerable is a very scary place. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. right? because, uh, because that means the other person has all this knowledge about you that they, if they wanted to, could misuse, could they not? They could actually use what they know about you against you. And that's a very vulnerable place. So what a lot of people do with vulnerability is they, they protect that little part of themselves, right? And they only give that part of themselves to other people who they trust. Right? So in other words, Vulnerability now, this expression of my own vulnerability, is limited by who I trust. Now, because most of us don't trust very many people at all, really, that means that our world has now shrunk. Our experiences have now shrunk. Because we're now not allowing the experiences that could happen if we allowed ourselves to be completely vulnerable all the time. You know? Now, we're often not vulnerable because people judge us when we're vulnerable. People judge our actions, they judge our intentions, they judge 
what we think they think about us. They're always analysing us and picking out what they what resonates with them and and you know, condemning the things they don't like about us and all those kind of things. And so what happens when we have all this condemnation and judgment and all these other emotions coming at us is we start to shrink. Like we start to go inside of ourselves and close down and, and you know quite often we picture it like closing down into that fetal position sort of thing almost, isn't it? Like getting into that state where we're just afraid to experience the world at all. And that's because when we receive all of these unloving emotions from others, because we're not allowing them all just to pass through us and let us have our own response to them, because often our response gets judged as well, we then now close down ourselves, which, which causes us in our soul to shrink, to get smaller in our capacity to experience love and joy and bliss and happiness and all those different types of emotions. We often say that to ourselves that we're protecting ourselves. Um, and that's what we tell ourselves because it sounds good and, and it helps us justify the fact that we're no longer being vulnerable to everything. Right? But in reality what's happening is that we're shrinking in our soul. Our soul has less capacity now to experience its universe than it had before because we're protecting our soul from experiencing the universe with barriers. We've got all these emotional barriers, if you like, to feeling the universe. So, so this aspect of vulnerability can just cause us to get into this state where we're just shrunken and shriveled when it comes to our experience. And you'll notice in your own life, many people have a very solitary existence. They don't experience very much out, outside of themselves. They go and do, they look after their food, their clothing, their shelter perhaps. But, but some have people have very, very sad lives, don't they, with regard to experiencing their world. Because they've shrunk so much that now they want to keep everybody out. Because keeping everybody out feels safe, but in reality, the soul in its expression has shrunk down into a state where it can't any longer be vulnerable to the universe that it lives in. So... Um, when we start growing towards God, my feelings are, though, that we grow in the opposite direction. We start to expand. <coughs> Our soul starts to expand. Now, in the spirit world, what happens is your, your soul expands in love. And you start, well, let's, let's call these dimensions, shall we, or what the spirits often call them is spheres. So let's say there's all these different spheres. Now many of the spirits that, who I've talked to don't even know that they exist, these dimensions. Right? But let's uh, look at what, what they are. They are, they are locations developed, that God's developed that are just suitable for the soul that's expanded to that condition. So you'll have the first dimension or the first sphere. Sometimes in the spirit world that's called like the point of entry or summer land. You might have heard of the time and it's called summer land. Well, that summer land's at the top of the first sphere. You've heard of the hell. Sometimes it's referred to in biblical literature and some of the other religious literature, um, in Hindu literature and so forth it's referred to as well. And they are the lower parts of the first sphere that are quite dark, very unloving places to live. So let's say you um, develop on this earth and you shrink so much that you now take out your rage on other people. So you, you now become, say, even a, a murderer or a person that assaults others or, or even murders another. Well, your soul condition would then shrink and when you arrived in the spirit world, your, you would arrive in a place that's just perfect for your condition, which would be one of these hells. And what, what one of those hells would be is a place where all the other murderers are as well. So you, all your friends are murderers, basically, and there's no one to murder, because all of them and they have passed into a bit better condition than they right? so, so now you're grouped together with a whole group of murderers, and there's no one to murder, so you can, be, you can imagine you can be frustrated there, right? And so, but that is the perfect location for that particular soul that's shrunken into that condition. 
The alternative is also we can grow in love. So we can grow in two types of love, as we talk about. But we can grow in love. In other words, we can get grow in love, in love enough on the earth that we're actually in the second dimensional space when we arrive in the spirit world. Now that space is prettier than the best location, the most beautiful location you could ever imagine on earth. The seconds in the second sphere. So not very many people from earth actually pass into that sphere. Uh, very few people. And in fact, it, historically, there's been no one who has ever passed beyond the third sphere of the spirit world aside from one. So, so these spheres are very, very uh, developed in love compared to what we experience love to be on the earth. So we can develop in love and we can arrive in these spheres and each time we've developed in love our soul, and remember we're talking about half of the soul, because the other half is your soul mate, that's a different part of you, and that has to develop as well at some point. But let's look at just ourselves, our half of the soul, we can develop in love and expand in love to get to the point of a different development in love. So these are dimensional spaces that we can develop. Now we can develop in two primary ways. So if we just put some lines across here, I might just break that. And a line across there. We can develop in two ways. And I'll just, by the way, this, it's not like the spheres are separated, but I'll just draw a line down the middle there because I want to say what the two ways are and we'll write them down on the book. One way is called what I would call the natural love path. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, what I term natural love is the love that comes <coughs> from within yourself that you can choose to give to another. So it's a love that you develop inside of your own soul. There's no external influences. Something, it's something that has to come from within yourself from your own desire and passion, and then it's projected at another. So, and there are different types of love with this. So there's, there's the uh, type of love that you would have for your children, for example. That's a love that comes from within yourself and that is aimed at your children. There's a type of love that you might have for your brothers and sisters, and, 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 and the Greeks used to have a word for it uh, called philia, which is a sort of like a brotherly affection. So there's the affection or the love that comes from within yourself that's aimed towards your brothers or sisters or family perhaps. And then there's this other type of love that's to do with the love that you have for, for some people that are not family but, but still platonic in nature. So let's call it, in the Greek word I think they used to use for that was storge, which is a type of love that you have towards those kind of people who, who are, so it's not a sexual relationship and it's not family, uh, but it is a special type of bond that you have with them. Then there's a type of love that you have for uh, everyone generally, even though you don't know them. So for many of us, we've not met, right? But I still feel an affection for you. Now, how can we have an affection for somebody that we haven't met? Well, there's this generalized sort of love. The Greeks used to call it agave, um, which, which is a, a love based on principle. In other words, you're a soul, I'm a soul, you're my brother, you're my sister, and so I have this love for you just because you are, and you are, you're alive, you're a being, and, and I love you. And then uh, there's the type of love that we have for our, usually for our partner, which is often a combination of those loves, right? Uh, but with the additional aspect, generally, of erotic love. Uh, and so we often have that love for, for our partner as well. Now, they are all parts, or all characteristics and attributes, of natural love, what I would classify as natural love. And they all, the reason why they're all part of that is because they all come from within yourself. And based on your desire and passion, they grow and are, and are given to, if you like, or we interact with others and we give them our love. We feel this feeling or emotion inside of us of love for them. And I would call that natural love. And I feel that all types of progression on earth pretty much, and almost every religion, develops that kind of love in some way. Now often they also 
have degradation of love in that way. So, for example, if I am on the natural love path, I will feel a love for all humanity. The instant that my religious leader tells me to go and fight somebody else, I am now breaking that law of love and now degrading in my own condition. Does that make sense? So I'm now going down in my condition. The, the, the instant that I deal with my child in an angry manner, I am no longer loving with my child and I'm just, just degraded my condition of love. Because every time that I act lovingly, I will love everyone around me, including my children, my parents, and, every, and everyone around me, every single person we see, will have this feeling. And remember, it has to be a feeling. It's not a thought of love, is it? Like, you can't think yourself into uh, loving your partner. I suppose many of us probably have. <laughs> but the truth is, it doesn't last very long, does it? And it has to be a feeling that draws you, doesn't it? Like, some feeling, that some desire and passion that grows within you. So all of these are based on feelings. So the natural love path is still about feelings, because we need to have feelings, but they are about the feelings that come from within us, directed towards others. Now, a lot of times, the natural love path is quite moral. Um, right? When I say moral, what I mean is that, like, many of you, and I'll, I won't say all of you, but many of you will not have the desire to steal from your neighbour. Some of you may have, right, in the past, so I can't say all of you. But many of you may have, may feel like, I don't want to steal from my neighbour, and I don't want my neighbour to steal from me. Right? Now that is what I would call a moral. There's a moral to that, uh, that principle, in that we actually have feelings of uh, maybe ownership or something, uh, that we've worked very hard for, and then we don't want somebody else to take that from us, and so we have this morality that goes on. I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying it's a moral that we have been built within us. And so we have this moral, like, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. The Bible moral comes from that, where, you know, you take something away from me, I'll take something away from you, and now we're even. That kind of principle, right? Um, I don't necessarily agree with it myself, but, but that's a moral <coughs> law. There are even more uh, important moral laws, I feel. Like, the type of moral laws, like, um, for example, how you treat another person in terms of what feelings there are towards you coming, toward, coming out of you towards the other person. Now, many of you know that you can sit in a place and be in a rage and... It seems like no one around you notices. Well, many of you know that you can probably sit in a place of sadness and feel like nobody around you notices, right? And we can often sit in an emotion of all different types and, and, and feel that no one around us notices. But in reality, I feel that if the feeling is present in the soul, then every other thing in the universe is responding to that feeling. And we'll talk about that perhaps in time. But but, and it's my soul, what I feel is my soul condition that determines in love, my soul condition in love that determines where I am in terms of my own progression. And it's not some competition like where we say, oh, but I'm better than you because I'm here and you're there. And nothing like that. It's to do with what our joy is all about. The more we live in love, the more joyful we will become. Now, Many people feel that there's a lot of pain in love, and my feelings are, if there's pain in love, then it's not love that you're feeling, it's something else. Right? And so, uh, and it might be neediness, or desire to control, or expectation, and none of those things are loving. When you're actually in a state of love, you don't feel this pain anywhere near, and in the end you'll get to a state, and we'll talk about that, where you don't feel any pain at all, physical, emotional, or spiritual pain but you are fully connected with your designs. Right? So it's not detuning from everything, as some spiritual paths would recommend. But on the natural love path, it's often also quite intellectual. Right? And when I say quite intellectual, even though it's, there's emotions involved, what often is the intellect dominates? So in other words, um, I'm feeling really angry inside, but I know that everyone around me is not going to want to know about my anger, right? So what I do is I push that right back down and just put a smile on my face, <laughs> right? And act 
loving to everyone around me, even though inside of me I'm feeling quite frustrated and angry. And a lot of people feel that if, they, if you do that enough, eventually the feelings of frustration and anger will completely disappear. And I think many of you have tried that over your life and found that that's possibly not the case, but um, that's often what we're taught. Huh? So a lot of times we use our intellect to dominate our emotional condition, our true emotional condition. We use our intellect to actually tell us what our beliefs are without actually believing it too. Now, there are, to, to give you an illustration of that, there are many people who have grown up in a religious way of life, like maybe some kind of Christian religion or some other religious way of life, that have huge amounts of anger inside of themselves, that they suppress completely, but whenever you meet them, you can feel this rage coming from them. Now, what they've done is they've, they've shut down, they've become intellectually dominant over their emotions, and they're not being real about what really exists inside of themselves. There are also many religious paths that teach like uh, that God is a punishing God, for example. There's also many religious paths that teach that God is a loving God, but they have a lot of doctrines about God being punishing. Mm. Right? So in other words, they say, and some may even come and knock on your door and say, you know, God's a loving God, but they actually, inside of their faith, have a lot of religious viewpoints that God is a punishing God, and that if you do the wrong thing, then there's going to be some kind of corporal punishment brought to bear. And even inside of their religion, they often have that. Back in the 60s, for example, the Catholic Church was very focused around divorce, and any person who got a divorce was basically excommunicated from the church, unless that divorce was recognised by the Pope you got excommunicated. So that, that is obviously now the religion, even though the religion is saying we practice love, right? Of the action is we're going to punish you when you do the wrong thing. And so what they classify again as wrong. And so what happens is often we're now trying to dominate our emotional state with our intellect. So if you're living in an environment like that, so if you were living in the 60s, you're in the Catholic Church, and you and your wife weren't getting along very well at all, and you decided to, have a break, to break up and go your separate ways, you would have felt a lot of emotion come at you from the different people in the religion as a result of that choice. Does that make sense? And that's a method of dominating the intellect, using the intellect, the rule, if you like, the moral rule, to dominate the emotion. <coughs> now, I'm not agreeing with the separation necessarily, and we'll talk about that separately if you want, but what I'm saying is when we, on the natural love path, we are often trying to get away from what we really believe and what we really think and what we really know. It happens all the time. And that's a part of the natural love path. You see it also happening in the New Age movement a lot, where you know you go up to a person and they say, yes, I'm all love now, like I'm just a being of love. And you're going, but, but you know, you just yelled at your husband, I heard you do that a day ago, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, but, you know, that was me standing my ground and living in my truth, right? <laughs> and there's all this justification of, of not being in love, right? When, and so, so that's, a very, very, that's very much the, um, one of the characteristics of de developing in natural love. Because remember, the natural love comes from within myself. And there are times I'm going to be very good at it. And there's going to be other times when I'm going to be very poor at it, depending on what emotions I have within myself. So if I have an emotion of anger that's related to my mother from my childhood when I was three, and then someone who comes along who looks like my mother, sounds like my mother, and feels like my mother to me, I'm going to very much want to express this three-year-old childhood emotion to her, probably. Right? And in that moment, I am not going to be loving to them. I'm going to be pushing all of this... Like, you know, I'm on this path of natural love, but the, this, it's got to come from within me. And because what's coming from within me is all this anger towards that kind of a woman, then naturally that woman's not going to feel much love from me, is she? She's going to feel that she's, you know, you're quite angry with her and upset with her. And she might not think that it's to do with when you were three either. And then she might say, what's this, you know, 28-year-old man getting angry with me for? So, so... On the natural love path, what's ha what often is happening is that we are sometimes good at it, sometimes not very good at it. Uh, 
in terms of displaying the love that comes from within ourselves. And the, if you look at the reasons, the reasons why we're not very good at it is because often we have some unhealed emotional condition from our childhood that dominates our interactions with others of a certain type of pe person, whether they be male, female, or whatever. Now, on the natural love pathway, we can get to a point where we're always loving to every person. And that point is, occurs in the dimensional, and we will be in what's called a dimensional space when we arrive in the, in the spirit world in the sixth sphere. And that is the highest possible progress we can make developing our own love that comes from within ourselves. And there are many billions and billions and billions of spirits in the spirit world. And I've talked to many of them. And they come from that location in the sixth sphere. And they're creating uh, many different, what you would call realities, right? Or experiences. They're enjoying their life. Some of one of the, the oldest one I've talked to was, was 50,000 years old. So I've been there for 50,000 years <coughs> in that way, in the state of the sixth sphere. They've grown into love where they're now perfect in the way in which their own love is expressed to other people and to other creation. And they've grown in love so much that they're now perfect in that expression. And they can do all of that without even acknowledging God, by the way. You can progress to that point on earth and in the spirit world without God being a part of your life at all. I've talked to some spirits who have progressed, atheists who have progressed to that point. So you would call them atheists here on earth, and they call themselves atheists in the spirit world, although they have very different belief systems to the atheists here on earth, but they don't acknowledge God at all, but they're living in this location in or the sixth dimension of the spirit world. So they're progressing through this place. This place is also very self-reliant, right? In other words, instead of relying on things outside of ourselves, and in particular relying on the creator of ourselves, we learn to just rely on ourselves. And this is something we learn very, very young here on Earth, right, isn't it? Like, you've got to work for yourself here on Earth to get what you need to live. If you don't work, what happens? Does anybody give you anything? Well, in some countries they do, but in the majority of countries, what happens? You don't get anything. If you decided to not work or not go and act in some way, you'll finish up starving to death in many countries on the planet. And that causes you to become very reliant on yourself. In other words, I become reliant on myself for my own existence. And therefore, I might even start becoming reliant on myself emotionally. You know, the way that happens often is I have a relationship with one person that doesn't work out and and half of my wealth got taken in that relationship, right? And then and then I have another relationship with another person that doesn't work out, and half of my wealth got taken in that relationship, right? By the third relationship, I'm starting to get pretty closed, don't I, about who I'm going to let in, what I'm going to let in, what kind of relationship it's going to be, how much I'm going to prevent them from taking my wealth, and there's a lot of blockages that start developing inside of me. And, the re and so I learned that I can only trust myself. I can't really trust anyone else. You know? And you say, oh, but what about mum? Can I trust my mum? No, because a lot of times my mum's yelled at me and she screamed at me and she has totally different opinions to me and quite often she belittles me and makes me feel small and what she always did when she was little and, and before I know it, I don't really trust my mum either or my dad or my brother or my sister and I come to live what I have, I, what finishes up to be a very self-reliant life. And the only people I trust are the people who actually prove themselves to me over and over again. And often even them I don't trust completely. Right? Now this, these are the characteristics of develop, developing my own love. Now I can get into a state of total self-reliance where I'm, I'm not reliant on you to give me any love, I'm not reliant on my partner to give me any love, I'm not reliant on my children to love me, I'm not reliant on my parents to love me. But I have enough love of myself that I don't need love from any of those people. And that is 
in the end, the way you will become even on the natural love path. You will become perfect in the way you express love. You will become an individual in, and individualized in the way that you express your love in a perfect way coming from yourself. But that's not what I'm promoting when I talk to people. And I feel that's a very limiting state myself. But it is the state that the majority of people choose to take. And it's also the state that the majority of people on the planet choose to take, and the majority of religions choose to take. You see, if we all chose to go this other direction, we wouldn't have so much separation. But on this path, you can see, because I am just reliant and trusting myself, I am naturally going to be quite separate from everyone around me, aren't I? Because of this self-reliant emotion. And even though I may love everyone around me, I am also, because I am self-reliant, I am producing everything myself. I, am, or I love myself enough that I don't need anyone else to love me, and so forth. And so now I'm so reliant on myself, that I, and I've developed myself in the way that I've lived, that I love other people. But, I am now going along having all of these lovely experiences that are up to my capacity to experience in that state, but I'm not going to expand beyond that state without there being some major changes happening inside of me. And I feel the biggest major change is connecting to God. Well, that's the biggest major change that has to happen. And that's what I would call the divine love path. So let's write that next to it. Now, the divine love path still has morals involved, but the morals are all emotional. Now, what I mean by that is, here on this path, we often moralise, <laughs> if we can use that word, where we say, oh, yes, uh, it's wrong to steal, or it's not good to take drugs. You know, any person who takes drugs has got this problem, that problem, and we moralise, and we've got all of these intellectual things going on inside of us and sometimes driven by emotions. But on the emotional side, when we have a moral, we feel it inside of ourselves so much that we can't break it. And we, and we don't have a very strong tendency to moralise. We don't have a strong tendency to tell others what they are. And when I say we feel it emotionally, there's a big difference between you not stealing something and you feeling like you shouldn't steal something. Can you see the big difference? One is, I, because I feel it, even if I stole it and nobody ever knew or nobody ever found out, I would still feel bad. Right? When I can feel it inside of myself. The second, if I just think it here, whenever anyone's not around, I can go and steal because I don't have the feeling that I feel bad about it inside of myself. Right? So as long as I don't get caught, I can go and steal. Or I could be walking down the supermarket and you could be saying, oh, it would just be so easy just to take something off there. And I have that feeling happen inside of me. I have that, that feeling that I could steal here. Well, that comes from within me. Some, something in me triggered that. And, and on, the, on this path, I would go, oh, no, no, that's wrong. On this path, I'd go, hmm, there's an emotion inside of me that caused me to have that thought. I wonder what that emotion is, and where that comes from. Can you see that this path is very much more about feeling the truth of the moral than just thinking it? See, when I feel it, I will act all the time that way, even if not a single other person is around. So you know what it's like when you're driving your car, right? The speed limit's there, 100 k's down here, isn't it? And I'm going along. I want to push it to 110, 115. Now, if if I had the moral in me, and I'm not saying <coughs> you need to have this moral, I'm just saying if I did, have the moral in me that I couldn't go beyond the speed limit, the moment I went 1k over the speed limit, I'd feel bad, wouldn't I? If it was inside of me. The fact that I don't feel bad means it's not inside of me, it's just here. <laughs> because I go along with that. As long as there's no police around, I can. You know, go 115, 120, whatever, right? That means that there isn't the moral inside of me. And this is the trouble with a lot of our laws on the planet, is they're made without any feelings involved, 
And so therefore, often we break them and want to break them because we don't have a feeling about them. Right? But on the divine love path, what starts happening is you start getting feelings about the morals. So you feel when you break them. And, they, and it feels bad, so you don't break them anymore. It just feels bad. So, you know, you might, a man might be walking along the street and he might be checking out each woman that's pretty and got a nice body going along the street, right? So, you're checking her out. Now, he at the moment might have the moral, intellectually, that he's not going to have sex with them. But there might be a feeling right at the same time going on as, well, oh, I'd like to take her to bed, I'd like to take her to bed, going on inside of his feelings, right? So, what's going on? There's a big difference between his feeling state and what he thinks to be, he should do. Does that make sense? And on the divine love path, what we do is we focus on the feeling state. So we, we're honest with ourselves. We say, wow, I didn't realise I had that emotion that every time I see a pretty woman, oh, I feel like taking a bet. I, I didn't realise I had that emotion. I wonder where that emotion comes from. Now, is that emotion loving? Well, obviously, if I'm in a relationship with a partner, it's not very loving to them, is it? to have that relation, that emotion. But, instead of judging it with my intellect, as I would do here, and then force myself into, you know, not looking or whatever, I force myself into doing, what I do here is I allow myself to examine my emotions. I allow myself to examine my feelings about why I had that feeling. And you know, a lot of times it will go back to some kind of childhood need that's not being, that ha hasn't been here inside of you emotionally. Alright, so so you could say that this divine love path is going to be very emotional. Now those of you who have already spent a little bit of time on the path, you know what it's like, don't you? It's like, instead of looking at everything intellectually now, you're looking at everything emotionally, and things are very different. Also, it's going to be God-reliant. So I, I have to work through this whole group of emotions that, that if... See, on earth what we do is we believe we, ma we can manufacture things without changing things in our emotions. And we often do not understand the law of attraction. You've heard of the law of attraction? Mm -hmm. right. Well, I would define the law of attraction as imagine this is your soul. Your soul is your emotional condition, your passions, your desires, your longings, your intentions, all added up into one place, if you like. That's your condition. That soul is what the law of attraction is based around. So I get things happening to me based on my soul condition, <coughs> not based on my intellect. That's why you can't sit at home going, give me a million dollars, give me a million dollars, give me a million dollars, <laughs> and all of a sudden a million dollars pops into that. Uh -huh. Many of you might have tried that in the past, but it hasn't probably worked that very well. And certainly, of, a, of an audience of 100, one person might have had the million dollars landed into that. But what about the other 99 who have tried exactly the same thing? Why hasn't it worked for them? Right. So it's because there's things going on in the soul. And the law of attraction operates, the law of attraction operates upon the soul. So that means that I become, if I understand that truly, I become soul-centric. I start to think about my soul rather than developing myself intellectually. And what does it mean to develop yourself at the soul level? It means to develop yourself in love, but from an emotional condition. So I notice, hmm, I felt some anger today, and you know, I dumped a bit of anger on my partner, and the response I got was a cold shoulder from her. That's her reaction to that unloving transmission of emotion, if you like. And that happened all day today. So what's going on inside of me? What did I attract? Well, I was angry, and I wrote down all the things I was angry about. And then what I could do is I start to feel about those things. And then I could also feel about her response. Her response towards me was rejection. So I could write down... Right? I created, my creation was, I created somebody rejecting me today. So what's going on inside of my soul? What's the emotions that could cause that inside of me? Now when I become emotionally connected, I will start seeing the relationship between everything that happens to me and what emotion I was feeling at the time. 
So right down to, oh, I just cut your finger, cutting up some... What was I thinking right at that moment? And what emotion was I denying right at that moment? And you'll be surprised when you start tracing it right down, you start seeing a complete and perfect relationship between every event that happens in your life, minute by minute, and the emotion inside of you. Either the emotion that's harmonious with love, and what happens is some very, very powerfully good things happen to you, and, or an emotion that's in disharmony with love, and usually some quite powerful, or, or even small, negative things happen right at that instant. And you can actually measure the difference. And on this path, because I'm now connecting to the fact, or trusting the fact that God designed my soul in this perfect way, I am now soul-centric. I've become so focused that I'm going to develop myself emotionally. I'm not going to worry anymore about what I'm thinking about so much because I start understanding that every thought that I've ever had and every question that I've ever raised in my mind came from an emotion. That at that time I was either accepting or denying every single thing that happened to me. Now, the beauty of progressing on this divine love path <coughs> right, is that we can continue progressing infinitely. So it's infinite progression. We are not limited because we are now progressing with the thing that God created. Remember, God created right back there in the beginning, I said God created souls. And remember, it was the act of procreation, the sexual act that created the bodies, and therefore the brain and the mind, right? The mind belonging to the spirit body, the brain belonging to the physical. They were created by humankind, by our parents, getting together with the sex act, right? The soul, though, was created by God, and that's the thing that can expand infinitely. And if I focus on developing that part of myself, I can develop infinitely in my growth. Now, the way I do that is by having firstly a longing that develops inside of my soul, a passionate desire that develops inside of my soul for God's love to enter me. Now, as God's love enters me, it starts doing some work inside of me. And it starts transforming me. And a lot of my prior unloving acts that I found very easy to perform now become very difficult for me to perform. So while before, like what I found within the first few weeks was um, I started longing for God's love again and all of a sudden every single time I ate meat I vomited. And I, I thought this was a bit strange. I thought I had a walk, you know, I had a flu or some, something that going on. So what I did was I just waited a few days to get over this, you know, this sickness that I thought I had. Right? And then I went and uh, had another meal of meat, and sure enough, got that vomited up as well. And then I thought, well, oh, this is not very good, because I really enjoyed my, you know, my lamb roast and my, um, uh, my whiting, you know, and crumb whiting I used to have, uh, and so forth. So I really enjoyed those. And, and I started to uh, think about, oh, I must be something, you know, sick. I must be sick. So, you know, how you go along to the doctor and check yourself out, and things <laughs> comes back fine. And so I decided oh, I'd go to my favourite restaurant and have my favourite meal, which happens to be also neat, right? and, uh, and see what happened then. And I came home and vomited that up as well. I actually you know, you go home. <laughs> <laughs> I only ate half the meal too, so I started to feel a bit, you know, crazy. And then, then I started realizing that actually there's something that had happened to me, and that is that my I couldn't accept my body eating meat anymore. It just happened like that. There's some some change that happened inside of myself. So I used to eat six meals of meat a day. Uh, yeah. There was a time in my life where I used to eat six meals of meat a day. Because I used to do the bodybuilding thing, right? And, uh, and, uh, and so I used to have, from breakfast to, to going to bed, basically, it was broken up into six, you know, three hour, two, two to three hour slices. And every, oh, I'd have a little bit of tuna, a little bit of this, not huge amounts of meat, but I used to have meat in every meal. So I got the point just after a few weeks of progressing on the divine love path again got to the point of 
just feeling like I couldn't eat meat anymore. And so rather than it just being something that like I told myself I had to do here, it was something that my body just completely rejected um, as a result of something else going on. And my mind was quite confused actually at the time. Like, and it took me a little while to realise what was really going on. That there had been a change inside of myself, inside of my feelings, that caused me to not feel like I could eat meat anymore. Does that make sense? And it just happened automatically. And when you think about it, if I loved everything on the planet, then one of the things I'd love is animals. And I'd be very, it would be very, very hard for me to slit the throat of an animal and cut it up if I loved it. So, and particularly if I can have something else like some vegetables instead. But, uh, and so what happened for me was that all of a sudden I went through these very rapid transformations. It required me letting go of lots of emotion. So there was a lot of childhood emotion that I was letting go during this space, like so crying quite a lot about some childhood events that occurred and letting go of different things that had happened. And as I was letting go of these different things and feeling God's love now into them, what happened was, all of a sudden, things started changing that I, before, <coughs> never thought I would ever do. So, I, in, in all of my life up until I was about 38 or 39, I never believed I would, I would not eat meat. And I'd look at some people who were my friends who were vegetarian, I'd go, oh, yeah, that's all right, that's all right for them, but I can't understand why they do that. Um, but all of a sudden, some changes happened inside of me, and all of a sudden, I couldn't do that anymore. And it just happened automatically. And this is the thing that is what I've found on this path completely, and that's just one example, is that the more you progress on this emotional side of things, things happen automatically without you even hardly noticing. But everyone around you starts noticing. Right? Everyone around you starts noticing they feel different things from you now that they, than they felt before. And, uh, you know, they might they look at you and they think, gee, you're looking really clear and you're looking really happy. What's going on? You know what I mean? Like they, they start seeing changes in you. And it requires you being honest and open about dealing with your emotions. And when you progress on that path, because progress is infinite, you can now progress into these other dimensional spaces. And what I've found is that you can progress... Um, there's progression that occurs, and at the moment there are 22 dimensional spaces, and you can progress on Earth into those locations by receiving God's love. So this is called the Divine Love Path because it's love of God entering your soul and transforming. And that's totally different from you developing the love within yourself. Can you see the difference? One is God's love entering you, coming from God, the other one is you developing your own love that comes from within yourself. Now on the Divine Love Path, what I've found is that you've got to progress, you've got to do both if you want to progress on the path, because you've still got to accept some natural love principles. In other words, what's loving with other people? How should I treat other people? But it's automatic, because as you release the different emotional reasons inside of you as to why you don't automatically treat them that way, and you receive divine love, all of a sudden, automatically, you treat them that way. And you can't help it. Right? So they're there yelling and screaming at you, and you can't help but be nice back. Right? You just can't help it. Because there's no longer the emotion inside of you that would cause the other response. Does that make sense? And that's the thing to understand. So, so what we've been doing is talk, talking to people about receiving God's love into their soul, and growing on this particular path. And what happens when you're growing on that path is that you automatically start feeling a togetherness with people around you. And when I say a togetherness, you start seeing every person as one of your brothers or sisters, no matter who they are. No matter how angry with you they are, no matter how upset with you they are, you still feel they are one of your brothers. And you feel that automatically. It's not something you've got playing in your mind. It's just a feeling that you have for them inside of you. And ironically, you also start feeling everyone else's emotions too. This is one of the reasons why people don't want to progress on the path. Because they go, oh, their emotions are pretty like, <laughs> you know, 
but you start feeling everyone's emotions quite sensitively. So you can actually feel what's bothering every person that you meet. And you understand them a lot more deeply than you would normally as a result of that. So while I'm interacting with you on an intellectual level, I'm not really feeling what's happened to you in your life. I'm not really feeling the emotional thing that's going on. What's the underlying emotional thing, the interaction that's happening at an emotional level. But as soon as I start progressing and getting, getting more and more closer to God and the way that God operates, I'm starting to get closer to my own emotions and also closer to everyone else's emotions. So now I can feel, rather than think, I can feel the actual truth of their person's emotions now. And everybody on the planet can develop in this way, where you get to feel the emotions of everyone. Now many of us already do that to a certain extent, don't they? It's like you wake up in the morning, you're there having breakfast with the family, and you can feel when your husband's not quite right, right? There's something going on. Or, or your wife, there's something going on. But most of us, what we do with that is we just detune from that. We just say, oh, they'll get over that, you know, by the end of the day it'll be different. And a lot of times it is, right, because we've had a whole day of busyness and so forth. And so we get over it. But on the divine path, what happens is you start feeling why that person is feeling what they're feeling. And what's the underlying emotional reason that needs to be healed within them before they'll feel differently in the long term? And you start feeling your own interaction with that person as well. And what's going on inside of that? Hey Jay, where does tough love fit in? Uh, no, I don't believe there's any such thing as tough love. I do believe there is. Love isn't love isn't wishy washy. Love is firm. When I say it, it's firm for principles. So uh, when I say so, when you say tough love, that sort of gives the image to people generally. And I know it's words, but it gives the image to people that you know you you've got to be angrily firm sometimes if you love somebody. I don't believe that you've got to be angry at all, but there are times when you do need to be firm with a person if you love them, if you love them. Firm for truth. So for example, if my partner, Mary, wanted me to lie for her, I just wouldn't do it. And I can't do it. Um, because there's a feeling inside of me that I can't. Like if I lied I feel bad about myself and I can't do that. So if Mary wanted me to lie for her, I can't do that either. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, well, once I'm, somebody's intrusive in your space, you know, and and and, and you have to live beside them. Um, number one, you never have to live beside anyone. My feelings are. <laughs> I know yours might feel different. When well, you say, I don't mean in a relationship. I mean in a neighbour. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I feel with a neighbour as well. I feel with a neighbour, you don't have to live beside them. So number one is there's no have to. Right? You, the truth is that if with a neighbour you could easily sell you out from the house and move. You just don't want to. Agreed? Well, it wouldn't worry me. I never thought of it like that, so thanks for the thought. So, so, so yeah, like, like if I've got a neighbour getting angry with me, right, or, or I've got a neighbour doing something that's unloving, that I feel is unloving towards me, then I could easily just leave. But I choose to not leave because I'm holding on to my house and I'm holding on to my property. And, you know, there's lots of reasons. I like the place where I live and, and all those kind of things. So I want my neighbour to change instead, right? <laughs> but what I want them to do is to treat me lovingly rather than me having to do these other things. So quite often we have very high expectations that everyone else treats us lovingly. right? And the truth is nobody on this planet has to treat you lovingly. If, if God designed a system where everyone had to treat you lovingly, right now, not a single person would be unloving to you. But God designed a system where everyone can have their free will, which means that someone is allowed to treat you unlovingly. So that's the first thing. We have free will, and you can do what you want. But that really isn't what the question was. The question was about tough love. And tough love is where you're being firm for what? Can you give an example? In, intrusive uh, verbosity. Um, Can you give a more specific example? So what happens with the neighbour? 
in mind? Well, I live in the one that I have on the state house, and she gave me a state house. Okay. And, it's, and it's attached to my neighbour. So you've got an, a, a de, sort of like a detached house? Like, yes. You know? right. Now, I hear him in the bathroom. I hear him, his, um, his uh, television in my lounge. It's, it's, it's sort of intrusive from... So he's loud? Yeah, he's loud. He's on uh, psychotropic medication up to his eyeballs. Yeah. I've had a bad day, Mary, and I dribbled a lot. Well, I really don't want to hear that. Yeah. Uh, you see, no. what, what you're ignoring, your name's Mary? Yes. What you're ignoring, Mary, is your law of attraction. Mary. Mary. You're ignoring your law of attraction. So look. what's my law of attraction? Well, let's have a look at the law of attraction. I didn't need to move. <laughs> Just doing housing is here, and that's with some soundproof. between Well, see, see, that's a very physical answer, isn't it? Let's put some soundproofing in yeah. and let's fix the problem. It's what's annoying is it? just the sound. It's the sound that's annoying, yeah. So we talk about it's this in the law of attraction. So we'll talk about it from the soul rather than from an intellectual perspective. So from an intellectual perspective, here I am, we've got our buildings, we're next to each other, our neighbour's loud, and we don't want to hear it anymore. Did you put the loud on the other side? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that one was you, though. Did I? <laughs> So our neighbour's loud. So what do we do with that? Not, not, only, not only loud. Okay, um, what else is it? <laughs> it's okay, you can you sound know, I, exactly I can't, right. I can't cope with the levels of medications that he's on. Why can't you? Because it, 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 it makes him into a vegetable. So he's a vegetable? Well, not, not, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Well, I don't mean a vegetable, but I mean... So he's drunk. Is he? Yes, he's drugged. Drugged. So he's drugged and loud. He doesn't even really know what he's doing half the time, does he? Like he has things turned up and he doesn't even really know why half the time. Is that, yeah. that, is that how it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is Marion's law of attraction. Oh, bugger. <laughs> so let's say, here's Marion's soul. So, and here's my neighbour's soul. And I've attracted this neighbour for something to heal inside of myself. Right? From an emotional perspective, not from an intellectual perspective. Intellectually, I think, I don't want loud, I don't want drug. You know, I want those away from me. That's what I feel intellectually. But emotionally, I've attracted it because it's there, right, in my life. And remember, there's a, there's a law, another big primary law of the universe is what you desire, you create. So you desired this at some point. You desired... A loud drug <laughs> Is that on the soul level? At the soul level, at yes. At the soul level. At the soul level. level. And remember, everything is at the soul level. Yeah. Nothing's here. It's all happening here. This is why people refer to the subconscious all the time, right? Because what happens is that most of the time we create things on what we think is underneath our conscious or our intellectual awareness. But in reality, if we become aware of our soul, we'll notice that everything we can become aware of. We know every creation that we've ever made and why when we become aware of what's going on at the soul level. So what feeling does this create in you? What's the feeling that the loud... Too much. Being overwhelmed? Is that yes, overwhelmed. overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed? <laughs> overwhelmed would be one of the words? In, intrude, intruded on. Mm. Right, so you sort of feel controlled, do you? Or? No, not Intruded upon. What's the last one? Well, I've been dear, kind, married to everybody all my life as a nurse, you see, and now that, now, now that I'm a, a pensioner, I need to have a little bit of control over myself. Mm. I want a little bit of my own space without having to be... So you've been giving out all your life. This is very important. You've been yeah. giving out all your life as a nurse. Yeah. And now you just want to not have to look after anyone. Yes. So when? Well, when, no, I mean because I want to choose who I want to go. Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so when you can't, so all of your life, a lot of your life, you've not been able to choose who you wanted to look after because you've had a job yeah. and I've told you you've got to look after that person, and so you did. Yeah. And now you just want to look after people you want to look after. Yeah. And when you can't do that, how does it feel? 
Well, it, it's like it gives it gives me a little bit of power <laughs> to okay. be able to to choose for myself. Okay, so you want the power of choice, which means that you're feeling like you don't have a choice. Is that not right? You're feeling obliged. No, I have a choice, therefore I choose. No, no, no. You feel you don't have a choice. That's your law of attraction. That's what you just said. You said that while this man is living next to you, you don't have a choice. You've got to put up with his drugged and loud behaviour. Oh yeah, right, okay. So you're not having a choice. You say here, and this is where the mind isn't very useful, you see. Because here you're saying, I have a choice, but you're, the, the proof is in your life. In your life at the moment, you don't feel like you have a choice. No. You feel like he has to change, otherwise, if he doesn't I'm change, moved. yeah, you're right. But the truth is, you still have a choice, but you don't really believe it as much as you think. You do. Ignorance is bliss, just ignore it. <laughs> it's the soundproofing. It's yeah. physical, but the soundproofing yeah. is just a physical effect. See, it's just an effect, and that's not what I'm promoting. You can go to another course and have that. <laughs> Someone will teach you how to do soundproofing. Oh, but I can't do it. Is it effect or effect? Sorry? Is it effect or effect? Well, uh, my, my addiction isn't very good. Which one is it? <laughs> effect is... To do with the emotions. No, it's an effect. What you, when you're soundproofing, you, you're just call it, trying to cure the effect, which yeah. is a man being loud. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's what I'm saying. I'm not don't want to get it hung up in the words. I just want to say if we try to put all, all we're doing is putting soundproofing here, that doesn't get rid of the fact that I have a law of attraction. And it, and my law of attraction is there to heal my own soul. Yeah. And ironically, it also if I follow the path of it, it will heal the other person a lot too, generally. But firstly, it needs to focus on my own soul. So the truth is that you do feel controlled by this, right? You're feeling I, like I, your environment. I'm disturbed that I'm doing that because I think more of myself and my soul than to be doing that. No, see, this is another intellectual argument. <laughs> <laughs> that might be very true up here, right? But the truth is you're attracting this. You see, you see, often what we do is we want to walk away from our law of attraction. Right? All of us do this, right? Because we, we want to say, oh, but I feel this. I, you know, we, really, what we're doing is we're thinking it. And I say, oh, but I think this. And I, I think that I have total control of my universe. I think that I... But let's look at what's actually happening in my life. What's happening in my life is there's this very disturbing neighbour who's having a fairly big impact on my life in that I'm not at peace with my life in this in this particular situation. Does that make sense? And that is because of my soul's law of attraction. It's my soul has attracted this from something inside of my soul. So I can tell myself that actually I'm not worried about being controlled, I've got free will, but right now I am being controlled by my loud, drugged up neighbour. Does that make sense? And that's what's really happening. That's my law of attraction. That's telling me the truth. You see, the law of attraction is God's messenger of truth to you. Right? So, it's telling me the truth of something that's inside of my soul. That if I want to be in a better state emotionally, I need to release. I need to let it go. The irony is that if I let go of the emotions that we finish up identifying here, the navel will automatically start quietening down. Because that's also what the law of attraction happens with the soul. And if you don't believe that, you, try, you should try it. Because most people, when they first hear that, they go, don't be silly. Like, that's not possible. Right? But, it, but you'll find it happening it happens all the time once you start experimenting with it. Right? Yeah. And that won't get him off his medication. Well, you'll be very surprised by that. <laughs> Let's look at this thing. He's loud and he's drunk, right? I mean, there's four other members of your family all on, on so-called bipolar medication. Yeah, but see, this is, the, this is where the intellect goes. And the intellect's not very powerful in the right? Because right? the intellect's going to say to me, no, no, he's right, I need to put in the, I need to put in the um, soundproof. Right? That's what the intellect says. Right? It's 
that I can think of have spell sample. Sound proof. Proof. That's my intellect telling me something. Right? And to be frank with you, you put in the soundproofing, he's just going to get a bailout. You try it. You can spend no, quite a bit of money on the soundproofing. No, I'd like to give my money to you. <laughs> I don't need your money, you just need to do with your emotions. Right? But what we need to do is this. So we can do the physical thing, which is often very tempting. Let's face it. The physical thing we think of straight away. Yep, yep. Now that seems like the most logical answer to me. So we do it. But um, what you will find is because of these things being in your soul, you will automatically attract more people doing the same thing to you. Even if you do the soundproofing, you're still going to attract more people doing the same thing. And it's your soul that's attracting it. Your soul, not his, not his. Your soul. Your soul is attracting exactly the type of person that need, that it needs to have this emotion triggered. So what sense? is this soul attracted? Well, his soul is attracting a person who's complaining about him being drunk <laughs> and loud every day. Right? That she's being kind to him. Sorry? That she's being kind. <coughs> yes, and so there's something in that. He's yes. being, like his soul is being quite demanding and he's got a person next door neighbour who's being kind and helpful and all those things. There's something in that too. Right for him, mm. but you forget about him because you can't change him. Yeah. You can only change yourself. Right. So what I've got to do is I've got to focus on what I feel in this interaction. What's my feelings? And you'll be surprised when you make a list, and these are not the emotions, by the way, uh, that are actually causing. If you go deeper into this, you'll find there's a whole group of emotions in there relating to this situation. And start, the best place to start is with your frustration. Because at the moment, the true emotion you're feeling is frustrated. Can't you? And it's okay, you're allowed to say you're frustrated. You know? Let's see, on, on the I, level, I also feel, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm not being true to my loving nature in, 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 in withdrawing and. In, yeah, well, I would suggest to you that in this case there is no loving nature. <laughs> and I'm just being frank. The reason why is because, because remember I said that it's not until there's a real emotion that's really inside of our soul that every time it reacts a different way. So, so there, you have often in the past manufactured a helpful th thing to help people because you feel drawn into helping them, right? But it's not based around love all the time, because often you've sacrificed yourself to help them, have you not? Now that means that you weren't loving. You see, love doesn't sacrifice itself in to, to help another. There's this common belief on earth that it does, but it doesn't. Right? Every time I sacrifice myself, I am going to experience some pain. Pain is not loving. So the, tr the truth is that if I'm experiencing pain, I'm not being loving in that moment, even to myself. So, so if I'm here, so this is you, and you spend a lot of your life helping other people, whoever they are, men or women, and you've been helping them, helping them, helping them, helping them. I'm exhausted helping them. I don't want to help them anymore. That feeling, right, is proof that you're not actually helping them for the right reason. And the, the right reason would be I just love them. Uh, uh, incorrect reason might be I feel like I have to, I feel drawn into it, I feel like there might be some addiction involved, you know, and it gives me a good feeling to know that I can help other people. Money, yes, is another another impure reason, but whatever the reason, it doesn't really matter, we need to see it within ourselves, you see. So, at the moment, you're attracting a person you have to help, a person you have to put up with, A person that feels like you don't have, like, you feel put upon in your space, don't you? Yeah. So, so you feel put upon. Now, can you see how this relates to your child? Yes. Be with. I lost my mother when I was seven. We had a housekeeper. You fit that bill. Yeah. But what about your relationship with your dad? 
because that's an area that you're not willing to look at. See, this is a man who's doing this, is it not? Well, Dad was a lawyer, he never went around here. <laughs> <laughs> but can you see how from a very young age you had to do a lot of the things that Mum would have normally have done? Yes, I had to look after my younger brother. Yeah. And you were forced into it, pretty much, weren't you? Well, that's, where, that's where the love came from. Well, yeah. this is the, see, this is where your definition of love is not matching the pain you've had. Right? So you see, oftentimes what we say is, well, I loved my younger brother, so I you know, had to help him, had to help him, had to help him, had to help him because I loved him. But actually, a lot of the times as we're growing up, we have a lot of resentment-based emotions there as well. Like, a lot of emotions that are deep within us that cause us to, to actually feel like, I've got no space of my own, I've got no time of my own, I've got, you know, everything somebody else, somebody else has, you know, and, and this is the same feeling that you're having with this man next door. And this is where you need to go to the child, the, into the child, into your childhood and examine that relationship, the fact that you were forced as a child to do certain things. And what's happened as an, as an adult is you're telling yourself now, but I loved him and not willing to feel the group of emotions that are causing this law of attraction with this man. Does that make sense? Yes. And it's this law of attraction with this man that's going to help you heal those emotions from the childhood. Right? Because you're forced into helping and putting up with and helping a person who you do have affection for, you, know, you, you do care for your neighbour, but you're sick and tired of the situation. And it's the same, isn't that almost identical with your brother? You do care for your brother, but sometimes you just wanted some space for yourself. But there's also stuff with your dad. With yeah. dad. With dad. Well, he, was never, he was never there because she was the bossy boots, the housekeeper, and she ran the place and did everything, and he kept the peace by staying away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he also did some other damage in that process, obviously. He allowed you to be controlled yeah. Yeah. by the situation. Yeah. You, you couldn't, as a child, you didn't have the space to grow. Right? And this is where it's very important to start stating the truth without judgment. You see, a lot of times when I say, but, but your dad didn't really care for you. If I said that to you, a lot of times we'd, we'd take that as a judgment of your father. Right? But my feelings are, if he really cared for you, he would not have allowed you to look after his son. He would have. Yeah, but I wasn't the only one. I mean, I had three other brothers and a sister. You see, the mind goes, every time. And honestly, when we go this butt route, route I'll work on it. Right? <laughs> every time we do the butt, we are basically using our mind now to skip over the feelings inside of our soul. Right? So the key is to, the key is to, like, I've had to stop doing that with myself. But this, but that, but that, uh, but you know, all of those buts. Stop doing that. What do I feel? Because it's my feelings inside of my soul that are being triggered by this event. And it's those feelings I need to feel and release before the event will go away. The event's not going to go away until the reason why the event is happening is released from me, and that is my law of attraction. Does that make sense? So in this case, this loud, drugged up man, who you have to help, right, is not going to go away from your life. And by the way, even if you leave this home and go to another one, you're going to attract another one of these men into your life. He's not going to, this man, not the man specifically, but this type of man is not going to go away from your life until you deal with this, with the group of emotions that are underneath this. Does that make sense? Yes. So the, the way to feel into it is to start by feeling the frustration that you feel. To, to feel the fact, you know, when you're sitting there and you feel like you've got to help him. Don't help him right at that moment and let yourself feel why you feel like you've got to help him. What, what's in it for you kind of emotion. Let yourself feel that. 
And if you start yeah, letting... It's, it's not so much help as avoid. No, but you're helping to avoid, aren't you? You're helping to calm... You're helping to get him to be quieter. So you want to avoid him? Anyway. When you see him do what he does, you want to stay away from him. Yeah. So I, I just don't want him in my life. Because because if you stayed there next door to him, what would you feel like? So so they say he's being loud and he's being all big drugged up and he's loud. What would you feel like you had to do if you were sitting next door? And you didn't and you couldn't walk off down the street and you couldn't go and talk to another neighbour and you couldn't ring up a friend and you couldn't watch telly yourself and you couldn't do anything else. You just had to sit with it. What would you feel? I'm well. <coughs> so that's a feeling you're being you're avoiding. Does that make sense? Yeah. So sit there and feel overwhelmed. So if you allow yourself to feel overwhelmed, what might happen then? Let yourself feel it. You feel like it's all too much. I feel empty. Yeah. <coughs> you need to go deeper than empty, because empty is not an emotion. By the way, just as a side effect, if, you, if you're dealing with emotion and you say you feel empty, numb, or any of those type of things, that is an avoidance of a deeper emotion. So there's something underneath that. So he's sitting there, he's got this noise going on next door, telly's on, da da da, and, I, and I'm not going to turn my telly on, I'm not going to phone my friend, I'm not going to do anything else, I'm just going to sit there and feel. This is what I would do in this situation. I would just sit there and feel what's coming at me. What am I feeling? I wouldn't get up and go next door and tell him off or anything like that. I would just sit there and feel what I'm trying to avoid. Because this guy is helping me heal an emotion inside of myself. So what do I feel? You can see it's going to take a bit of practice. I'm turning up time at the moment. I no, no, move on. <laughs> no, that's all right. So can, you, can everyone see how dealing with something emotionally is very, very different than dealing with something intellectually? Intellectually, I go, but he's not going to change, and he's not <coughs> drugs, and he needs to be on drugs, or whatever. Intellectually, I can go all sorts of things with my mind, but I, once I heal the emotion, you'll find things will change. And, and like, everyone who tries this eventually sees the truth of it once they heal the emotion. Everything around you changes. Everything. He may leave. He may all of a sudden have a... Have a family friend say, oh, I'll take you into my place. So all sorts of things will happen and all of a sudden something will change when you deal with the group of emotions that create. Does that make sense? And experimentally, <coughs> if he's still there doing the same thing, you know that the emotion inside of you isn't changing. Yeah. So all you need to do with that, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful system, I feel, because it tells you the truth at every single instant yeah. of what's going on in your life. So, you know, you can be driving along and all of a sudden there'd be a near accident. Oh, something happened there. What was I feeling? You know, there's always something that created it. Always something. I've had all sorts of things happen, and I've described some of them in the DVDs. Um, all sorts of things happen to me. Once I've changed the emotion, totally the opposite things happen. Yeah, automatically, without me having to make it happen. Right down to not having a meal to getting a meal. All sorts of things just through dealing with the emotions. Anyway, it's time to have a bit of a break, I reckon. So let's have that, and maybe if we start again...